the, here's an example with um, the exponential function. Let's work through this. I can, I can feel some yawns in the back, but let's work through this because the next one is an example which uses this particular case. Okay, so let's say we want to find the antiderivative of e to the kx. k is a constant not equal to zero. Okay, um, so in that case, you know, so here it's not, we're not using the power rule that we used in the past. What was the, um, what was the derivative of k to the, k times e to the kx from the last session? Anybody remember? So if f, uh, let's say f x is k e to the kx, then the derivative was what? Okay, let's just do e as to kx. Oh, that's right. I, I, in that case, it's k e to the kx, right? Okay, so um, e to the kx is derivative of this inside function times itself. Okay, derivative of e to the x is just e to the x. And the derivative of this inside function is k. So it's k e to the kx. Now, um, so uh, suppose that you have, suppose the derivative is actually e to the kx. Okay, you know that the exponent is not going to change, right? That's the feature of the exponential function. When I took this derivative, the exponent didn't change. Okay, unlike those polynomial functions. So that's going to go back to something like e to the kx. Okay, but um, if I had e to the kx and I took a derivative, I would get k e to the kx. But I don't have a k here. So I'm going to have to divide by k, right? So that's going to be 1 over k. Everybody with me? No? OK, so let me do that again. You realize that if I were to take a derivative of e to the kx, then I'm going to take this coefficient, put it in front, and keep the exponent the same. Okay, so I would go from e to the kx, take a derivative, I'd get k e to the kx. Exponent stays the same, and I'm taking the coefficient in the exponent and putting it in front. But, uh, but here, I've just done it this way so as to help remind you that this is a function and this is its derivative. It could be a little f. So there would be no difference if I had simply done. The important thing here is that this is the prime of whatever that function is. OK? So uh, when I take a derivative of an exponential function, the exponent stays the same. and. Uh, I take the coefficient from the exponent and put it in front. So I know I'm being told that I have a derivative equal to e to the kx, and I have to find its antiderivative, i.e., the function which, when differentiated, gives me this as its derivative. I know that for exponential functions, the exponent didn't change. So I know that that antiderivative has to have the term e to the kx. There will be no change in the exponent. But I, I look at this and I think, well, if I were to take a derivative of this, 
I would end up with k e to the kx. I'd end up with a k in front. But I know I didn't end up with a k here. So there must have been something here which when multiplied by k gave me a 1. Well, what is it that when multiplied by k gives me a 1? 1 over k, right? OK, yeah, so you wouldn't do that. In other words, you wouldn't, you would take the k and multiply it by the coefficient, but not the kx. OK, so just look at, this is the, um, this sort of the simple example. If you have e to the kx, when you take its derivative, you're going to take the k and put it in front and leave e to the kx here. Because you have, what you have to do, this is if you apply the chain rule, I know we didn't spend much time on this, but if you apply the chain rule, you could think of e to the fx as this function, right? And so the derivative of this is going to be f prime of x, that is the derivative of the inside function, times e to the fx. And f prime of x here, if this is the inside function, is just k. In other words, the derivative of kx is just k. OK? Is that clear? OK, we'll, we, we'll talk, we can talk about it after class. We'll, I'll show you with the chain rule, applying the chain rule. Yes. Did you have your hand raised? OK. Oh, there is a constant. There has to be a constant. Sorry, this is plus c. OK, so that's there, right? OK, and of course, k can't be 0, since division by 0 is not allowed. OK, a um, couple of rules to keep in mind is, uh, the sum rule, this is sort of what you'd expect. That is, the integral of a sum is just the sum of the integrals. And the constant multiple rule, that is, the integral of a function times a constant, constant coefficient, k, is just that constant coefficient times the integral of the function. In other words, you can take the k out of the integral sign. OK, let's do an application. I think that's, that might help to fix ideas. OK, if we think of oil consumption, so remember that the derivative is the speed, and the antiderivative is, in some sense, the area. OK? And I want you to have in mind, did, uh, let's see if I, I don't think I did a picture for you there. OK, I just want you to have a picture in mind for this. Okay. So let's read the problem a, a little bit. During the early 1970s, the annual worldwide rate of oil consumption grew exponentially with a growth constant of 0.07. So that's about 7%. Okay, so you could think about it as 7% annual growth. At the beginning of 1970, the rate of consumption was 16.1 billion barrels annually. Okay, so January 1, 1970, the annual rate of consumption is 16.1 billion barrels per year. And every moment, it is growing at the rate of 7% per year. So at the end of 1970, it would have grown from 16.1 to 16.1 times 1.07, approximately, right? OK, so um, you could draw uh, the following if 
function on the x-axis I've got time and let's say that starts at 1970 um, and at 1970 I know that the rate of consumption was 16.1 Okay. And I know that that rate of consumption is growing exponentially at 7% per annum. So when, it, when things grow exponentially, it usually looks like that. Okay. It's, okay. Now, it turns out that the area under this curve, this is the rate of consumption as a function of time. The area under this curve is going to give you the total consumption of oil since 1970. Okay? You could just imagine that if, you, if I were to think of each of these increments as one year, then in the first year, approximately 16.1 barrels are consumed. In the next year, 16.1 times 1.07 are consumed. And in the, th the third year, 16.1 times 1.07 times 1.07 are consumed and so on and I could add up all those rectangles of course it's not exactly that because the growth is happening instantaneously that is it's growing at 7% per year but it's not that it grows for 7% uh, it's not growing in discrete time it's growing instantaneously so that's why we have this function okay uh, so you can imagine, certainly, that the area under this curve would approximate uh, the total consumption of oil up to whatever time t uh, I had. Okay? So, um, so let's let RT denote the rate of oil consumption at time t. t is the number of years since the beginning of 1970. So the function RT is just... 16.1 e to the 0 0.07 t. Okay. Now, if you let capital T of t be the total oil consumed from 1970 to time t, that's just the area under the graph and, of course, the area under the graph, total oil consumption to date t, you know that RT is the rate of consumption per year. Remember, what is a rate? A rate is probably a derivative of something. And it's going to be that the rate is the derivative of the total consumption. So the rate is going to be the derivative of the total consumption. Okay. Okay, another way to put it, the reverse way to put it, is that the area under this curve is given by capital T. Okay, as you increase T, the rate is going up and so is the area. Okay? Or you could think of capital T as the antiderivative of R. Okay. Um, so suppose, what was our question? Um, actually, we don't have a question, but this, this is uh, 
this is a way to to this is a way for us to use the antiderivative in a problem that one might care about. Um, so I said capital T is the antiderivative of R. Okay, so that's the same as saying um, that's the same as saying that this is R. I put it inside the script S and DT. So that's the antiderivative. This is the derivative, the rate. Now, if I want to find out what the total consumption at time period t is, I can take out this constant using the rule that I just mentioned. So I can pull that 16.1 out of the integral. 16.1 times the integral of this thing. Well, this you already know how to find the antiderivative of. What is this? This is just e to the kx, right? And what did we say that was? That was going to be 1 over k times e to the kx. So that's 1 over k, that's the k, times e to the kx. The x in this case is t. Okay, so that's. So once you worked out that antiderivative, and there's also the plus c, once you work out that antiderivative, you can get rid of the script s and the dt. Okay, we've found the integral. And then you just distribute the 16.1 and you get this. So the total consumption at time t is given by this function. Now this is a class of functions. Right, this is not one function, it's a class of function. I know that my total consumption at time t has to have this characteristic. Well, I can find the exact c that, I, that applies because I happen to know that by definition this t of 0 is going to be 0. What, you know, so let's say that that T, if I've set T, well, I've, I've got some definition of T, right? T is the number of years since the beginning of 1970, right? So when T is zero, that's 1970. And I care about total oil consumption since 1970. So I know that in 1970, this function is equal to zero. In other words, this function is equal to zero in 1970. And in 1970, t is equal, little t is equal to zero. So if that's equal to zero, that's equal to zero. e to the zero is just one. Okay? And so that's going to be 230 plus c is equal to zero. Okay, and that's. Uh, sorry, that's another problem. So, so by doing this, I can work out that C is minus 230. Right, so T is 0. 0 times 0 0.07 is 0. Anything raised to the power 0 is 1. So that's just 230 plus C is equal to 0. So C is equal to minus 230. So what I really have, this function, now I've... Now I no longer have a class of functions. I have a single function. That C, I've been able to pin down exactly. Right, so we have, we're not done yet. Oh. That, this is a function that tells me, that gives me the total oil consumption from 1970 to any period T. Okay, and that's a function of T. Well, total amount of oil that would have been consumed from 1970 to 1980, T would be 10 years. So I just plug in the value 10 into T. So 10 times 0.07 is 0.7. So the answer is 230 E to the 0.7 minus 230, and that happens to be approximately 233 ba billion barrels. 
Okay, so you could think about it in the following way. Remember, we started out in 1970 consuming 16 billion barrels a year. If we just consumed 16 billion barrels a year for 10 years, we would have consumed 160. Right? But because we have exponential growth, by 19, let's say this is 1980, we're at a significantly higher number. So it's not 16 times 10. It ten so it's not 160, but it turns out to be 233. Oh, E is an actual number. It's approximately 2.71. So it, it's in your calculator, right? E is a constant. E, so E is a constant. Okay, so actually this is going to go fast because I think you understand integration now. And we're really going to talk about its interpretation. And in particular, instead of talking about the indefinite integral, we'll talk about the definite integral. So you see from that last application that you can think of the integral as a function that gives you the area under a curve. Okay? Just like you could think of the derivative as a function that gives you the slope of a curve, you can think of the integral as a function that gives you the area under a curve. Now, um, often, and so in this case, I was looking for the area under the curve um, starting at zero. The indefinite integral will give you the area under the curve for the entire function. Often we want to know the area under the curve for a particular segment of the x-axis. Let's say from the value of x equal to a to the value of x equal to b. We only want to know this area. Well, in principle, what I could do is I could work out the area under this curve from minus infinity to b, and then work out the area under this curve from minus infinity to a, and take the difference between the two. And that's generally what we do when we compute the definite integral. Okay? Um, and so here I talk about the Riemann sum approximation, but nothing here is more in depth than what I already said. So let's just skip that. Um, so what's the definite integral? It is simply, if I didn't have these a's and, if I didn't have this a and b, you know what this beast is. It's simply the integral of f of x. That's the area under the curve, f of x, from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, if I put the integral from a to b, then that's like saying I want the area under the curve from a to b. If I don't have the a and b, it's from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay. So the definite integral is the limit of the Riemann sum as those delta x's go to zero. That's the width of those rectangles. Um, and if fx is continuous and non-negative in a, b, then the definite integral is the area under the graph. The thing that you have to watch out for is that this is non-negative. If it were negative, then you'd have to switch um, some signs around. Okay, but it's helpful just to think of it as a non-negative function. Anytime you have a negative function, you can always convert it into a non-negative one by multiplying by minus one, which is a constant which you can take out of the integral and so on, right? Okay, um, now, what's the fundamental theorem of calculus? It sounds, um, it sounds like a big deal, but actually it's, it's, uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't look as intimidating as it sounds. This is the fundamental theorem of calculus. 
um, suppose that little fx is a, is a continuous function on that interval a, b. And suppose that big fx is its antiderivative or is an antiderivative. Then um, the definite integral from a to b of little fx is simply the, the indefinite integral evaluated at b minus the indefinite integral evaluated at a. Okay, that means you take the value of x equal to b, you plug it into the indefinite integral, and you take the value of x equal to a, you plug it into the indefinite integral, and you take the difference between those two values. What happened to the constant of integration here? It, was, it disappeared, right? Because I could have had capital F of B plus C minus capital F of A minus C. So the plus C and the minus C would cancel out. Okay, so the C gets lost. If you think about it in terms of this picture, remember I said, I could take, if I had some function that described the area under this graph, and I called it capital F of X, I could evaluate it at the point B, which would be the area under the curve from minus infinity to B. And then I could evaluate that function capital F at the point A, which would be the area under the curve from minus infinity to A, take the difference between those two, and that's the area. Okay, and that's exactly what I'm doing with this fundamental theorem of calculus. Everybody see that? Okay, I, I, I need you to get this interpretation. I don't care if you don't know how to find an antiderivative from a particular function. Okay? Okay.